turn this morning to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Let's read verses 1 down through verse 13. That'll be the text for today. Um, and then we'll get into the lesson. Luke chapter 16. He said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. He called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest, no longer, uh, thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Well, take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. And then he said to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye, fall, when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. This parable was given to his disciples, and our Lord gives them a lesson about stewardship. Uh, a steward is not really um, a position that we have to this degree anymore. I and mean, we, we have... Uh, accountants, we have departments that deal with accounts receivable and accounts payable. Uh, a steward would have been all that and more in a household. He would have been responsible for the financial oversight. He would have been responsible for the household uh, of another person. In our text, we have a dishonest steward. This is often called the, the parable of the unjust steward. He's, he's dishonest. Uh, and yet he was commended, he was actually commended by the very person that was going to fire him. Um, number one, let's talk about this dishonest steward. It tells us in verse one that there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. When you put someone in charge of your house or your affairs, or you put someone in the accounting department, you want to know that they are trustworthy. You want to know that they're honest. They're reliable. They're dependable. This man wasn't. Now, our, our kids will never um, understand maybe what we grew up with, and certainly even to our extent, we don't understand what all the generations grew up with in the past. Um, there was an age before electronic banking. You know, now I can see every transaction that's done on my card basic virtually right after I swipe it right and um, the the bank will do all the work it'll show me all of my pending transactions it'll tell me you know what I spent where I spent it what was deposited um, and when and all of those things I can get a printout just by going online and you know take inventory or take stock of my affairs of, of my money there was a day when all that had to be done manually. It actually hasn't been so long um, when you had to do all of that manually, right? You had to uh, get the checkbook register, and whenever you wrote a check, you had to write, write out the line, and you subtracted it, and you kept, you kept details, you kept your budget, you kept all the bank statements. All of these things you, you did manually. You had to hand write things out. You had to hand key things, even if you tried to put it in a database somewhere. 
if you didn't do it yourself or if you had someone do it for you and that person wasn't trustworthy, you could be very much in trouble. And that's what we see here. We have a master, we have a Lord, we have a very rich man who has a steward. Now, why he's rich, what, what, um, you know, what business he's in, uh, it doesn't say exactly. Now, it does tell us um, in verse 6 and verse 7 that apparently maybe he's in the business of oil and wheat and he's accumulated money somehow. He's a rich man and he has a man dedicated to his affairs that, that keeps stock of accounts payable and accounts receivable, watches over his money, and he trusts him. Well, apparently from verse number one, uh, an accusation came against his steward that he had wasted his goods. So in verse two, it says, he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship for thou mayest be no longer steward. Um, I've heard a rumor. Uh, I've heard that you've wasted. Now, whether that wasting is uh, embezzling or uh, frivolous spending, whatever it was, the, the master has received accusation that this steward is not on the up and up. The master found out and was going to call him to give an account. You know, it, apparently the master, the Lord here, has not looked at the books in quite a while. Uh, he obviously trusts his servant. He trusts his steward to do what's right, to take care of his affairs. Uh, and now he wants him to give an account. And if he doesn't like the answer that's received, uh, and if the accusation is true, if the rumor is true, this guy's going to lose his job. He says, thou mayest be no longer steward. Um, so that's the accusation. Um, let's read in verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. He knows. <laughs> All right, yep, he's going to find out. I'm going to lose my job. He's going to take away the stewardship from me. And he says, I, I cannot dig. Now, different commentators will tell you that that means different things. Some will say that it, was, it had to do just with ability, and he actually had no ability to dig. Some say that he was an older person and, and had gotten beyond the, the years of ability to dig. Some say it was a pride thing. You know, I, I can't, ain't digging. You know, go out and get an honest job. Yeah, right, I can't do that. Um, and I'm not going to beg. So um, he's way too proud to beg. He's not going to ask for a handout. Um, so what is he going to do? Well, he has a plan. In verse 4, actually, he's very much resolved as to what to do, it says. When I'm put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. He's going to make sure with his last hours of, of stewardship that he plans and makes arrangements so that when he loses his job, he's got a backup. He's got someone that will take him in. He's got someone that will provide for him. So here's what he does. Verse 5, he calls everyone um, of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. So in other words, he's going to continue to cheat his master. He tells the first guy, Well, how much do you owe my boss? How much do you owe the master? Oh, a hundred, you know, a hundred measures of oil. Tell you what, take your bill, you write down 50, pay for 50, and I'll mark it paid in full. That, that's his plan. He goes to the next one. How much do you owe? Well, I owe, um, what does it say in verse 7? Yeah, a hundred, hundred measures of wheat. Okay, well, you take your bill and you write down that you owe 80. And you pay, if you pay the 80, I'll mark it paid in full. That's his plan. He's going to be lenient on some of the debtors. He's going to give them a break. He's going to cut them some slack. He's going to reduce what they owe, continuing to be dishonest, continuing to cheat his master. But he's doing this in hopes and with the idea that I'm going to lose this job. Um, maybe if I cut these guys some slack, if I lessen their bill, they'll make it up to me. You know, they'll take care of me later. Now, 
I'm going to guess that if Brother John is interviewing someone for a position and, they're, and he asks them, why'd you get fired from your last job? Well, I was stealing from the company. Um, I'm going to guess that he's not going to get the job, um, but I could be wrong. Um, but here's a guy that's, you know, he's obviously doing underhanded things, but he's doing it in hopes that these guys will remember that in the future and that they'll, you know, man, I, I just cut this guy's bill in half. Maybe he'll cut me some of that, you know, kind of as a deal. This man continues to be a cheat, a swindler. He's dishonest. He is in all points an unjust steward. Okay. But number two, the wise steward. Because that's what it says in verse number eight. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. This plan is, is full of cheating and lying and stealing. But the Lord commended him for being wise. He didn't commend him for being honest. Okay, Always remember that part. He's not commending him for doing what's right. He's not commending him for, for being a stand-up guy or doing the right thing. But uh, a good word, maybe, if you, if you don't want to use the word wise, might be shrewd. You know, um, I see what you did there. And, and he commends him for being wise. Um, you took of mine. You knew you were going to lose your job. So you continued, though be it dishonestly, you at least kept an eye on the future. You made arrangements. You made plans so that you would be taken care of. And the Lord said, you know, I see it. I understand. Uh, it's not the right thing to do, but it was wise in the effect that he was looking out, preparing for the future. Now that was the wise steward. And lastly, where we want to spend the majority of our time, what's the point here? Well, verse 8 says, For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. What's the point? Let's get into some lessons that we can learn here from this. Uh, first of all, perspective. Right? Here, is an, here is a steward that at least of all his flaws... And he's dishonest, and he's not, a, he's not a good man. He's at least a thinking man, and he looks to the future. And he is willing to look and to prepare for the future, even at the risk of um, the loss of a job now, the loss of reputation now. Uh, his eye on the future, his perspective of what comes next oversees all that he does and he's willing to um, to sacrifice he's willing to to make deals he's willing to do whatever it takes to ensure his future um, satisfaction his future uh, happiness now in verse 9 it says and I say unto you make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations now, every one of you have probably heard this, that, you know, there are some things money can't buy. Um, one of them, you know, money can't buy love. Money can't buy happiness. Money can't buy friends. Well, what does it say there in verse 9? And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Is it possible that you can buy friends? Well, what's he talking about? Well, he's obviously talking about the investment that you make. Now, whether that be money, whether that be time, whether that be work, whatever it is, uh, it is important to invest in people. It is important to invest wisely, to make to ourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He's obviously talking about money in this passage, okay? He's talking about money, the right use of it, spending it so that what? So that the work can be furthered and so that um, when ye fail, when the day comes that you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, obviously, the context here would, would dictate an understanding that he's talking about the right use of money, spending money in the Lord's work, spending money, investing money into the gospel message so that 
you know, it, it would be nice to have, you know, for lack of a better term, it would be nice to have a welcoming party when you get to heaven, right? And be able to see the faces that are there as a result of your investment in God's work, right? Um, you, you spend money, you, you spend time, you spend effort in the Lord's work, and it makes a difference, and souls are saved because of it, and then the day comes that they receive you into everlasting habitations. That would be neat to think that there, you know, there would come a day uh, when we stand in heaven and we see people that we didn't even know, um, but they're there because of our investment in the Lord's work, right? You know, Brother John has talked about um, churches that support us. That, that invest. There, there, are, there are churches, there are preachers that, that support us. They support the mission work here. They've never preached here. Some of them have never even been in this building. They don't know all the details, but, you know, but for the, the letters and the reports that Brother John gives, um, you know, they don't have you know, really any knowledge uh, of the day-to-day -day operations and what, and what we do. And yet, they have chosen to invest in the work, in hopes and in trust that this is a good work, that, that we're going to attempt and give effort to get the gospel out, to reach people in the Cottleville area, and they want to be a part of that. They want to invest in that. They want to spend of the mammon of unrighteousness that when the day comes and we all fail, there will be you know, those that receive us into everlasting habitations. Um, it's just a thought. You know, when he says to buy friends, um, he's being serious. Verse number 10 says, he that is faithful in much, oh, I'm sorry, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Money in the grand scheme of things isn't, isn't nearly as important as other things. Right Now, money's important. Um, a man that doesn't provide for his own, the Bible says, is worse than an infidel. And, and money is necessary to keep the Lord's work going, right? We live in a society that's just overwhelmed by the love of money. Um, money money's important. And yet in the grand scheme of things, we know that by comparison, money's not as important as a lot of other things, Right? Um, money's not any more, is it any more important than our family? Obviously not. Is money more important than our church, than, than the Lord's work? No, obviously money's not more important than those. Is money more important than your testimony and your reputation? No, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. So by way of comparison, you know, money's a, a little thing. But it gives an indication, the Lord says here in verse number 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. By how a man uses those things that are considered small, what he does with those things that aren't valued of great importance in the long term gives you an indication, understanding of how he would be with things that are important, right? If you can't trust someone in something that's small, you know, can you trust them with something that's greater? You know, as as people grow, you know, as as our kids grow, we give them we give them tasks, we give them chores, we give them jobs. As they complete those, as they show their ability and their faithfulness to complete those things that are smaller and those things that are on the lower level, then they get what? They get more responsibility. They get more trust. They get more, you know, of all of those things. It works the same way um, with our faithfulness and understanding that if we're not faithful with that which is little, could we really be counted on to be faithful with that which is much? It, we, we're, we're very prone to touting our own faith. And listen, I, nobody wants to, obviously nobody wants to deny the faith, but nobody wants to look at themselves and, and confess you know, any unfaithfulness. Nobody wants to think that the, you know, the day would come when our faith would fail. It would be very much easy for us to, to, to be like Peter, right? That, man, you know, Lord, everybody else may deny you, but my faith will be strong, and, and, and I won't do that in those days. 
Um, well, we see how that did work out for Peter, right? Um, we, we think about today. We are very much concerned about the potential and maybe not immediately, but, but as the table is said, I think we're all kind of concerned about the next couple generations and potentially persecution that Christians may face, right? And, and there's very much a, um, a question about, you know, man, when persecution comes, who's, who's going to stand? Who's going to be the real deal? Who's going to really, you know, stand and fight and face it and be faithful and not give in and all those things? Um, do you want to know the answer to that question? Who's reading their Bible right now? Who, who, has a, who has a firm relationship with the Lord in all of those small things, right? If, would you feel confident in me if I said, boy, you know what? I'm ready for persecution to come. Let it come. I don't care. Um, I'll stand if nobody else will stand. But Sunday morning was the only time I actually came to church. Or... Um, you know, you couldn't count on me to contribute to the Lord's work in any other way. But, but someday I'm going to stand. I'm, I'm going to stand tall. I'm going to stand strong. I'm going to face persecution. Um, I, I wouldn't have that faith in myself. I wouldn't have that confidence in me. You wouldn't have that confidence in me. I wouldn't have that confidence in you, right? He that is faithful in least is faithful also in much. How you are handling those things now is an indication of the faithfulness you would show if more were put on you. So in verse number 11, if ye have therefore, if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to yourself, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If I'm not, and, and let's just keep it in the context here, he's talking about money. Um, if I'm not faithful with money now, in the least, why would he give me anything important? You know, we just said in, from the earlier verse that um, money, in the grand scheme of things, isn't really all that important. It's not, any, it's not more important than souls. It's not more important than the Lord's work. It's not more important than our family. But if I can't be faithful... In that then, if I'm willing to admit and recognize and confess, you know, in the grand scheme of things, money's not all that important. And yet I'm a miserable person when it comes to handling that which is considered very little. Who would commit to me true riches, right? If, uh, if you're not up to the task in a lower job, it's not likely that more responsibility would be heaped on you. I think that we could see that in work, you know, like at our daily jobs. We could see that in the Lord's work as well. That our faithfulness in the here and the now, in that which maybe other people consider to be little, um, that is a foundational ground. That is a foundational layer that has to be laid uh, and is an indication of the faithfulness that we would show um, in bigger things. Faithful in little, faithful in much. And if I'm not faithful, according to verse 11, and if I'm not faithful in this, if I'm not faithful with my time, now let's get out of the pre present context of money and let's just talk about life. What if I'm not faithful with my time? We always talk about how, you know, there's just not enough hours in the day, right? There's that I'm, I'm always... I'm always running out of time. I don't have time to do everything that I want. I don't have time to do all the projects that I want. Well, if, I don't, if I'm not faithful with my time, why would he give me more? Right? If I'm not faithful with the abilities, if I'm not faithful with the, with the abilities that I have, with, um, you know, with the strength, with the will, with the ability to get out to work and to do, if I'm not faithful with that, why would he give me more? Why, why, would the give, why would he give more ability if I wasn't faithful with those things? Um, 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4 verse 10 it says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister 
the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. So as a steward, as a good steward of the manifold grace of God, we take of that which we have been given and we invest it and we use it and we work with it. You read through Luke chapter 16 in the parable of the unjust steward, and here you have a man that is sacrificing his job. He is sacrificing his reputation. He is making sacrifices in the short term because he actually has a long-term vision, right? He has, a, he has a look to the future. He has a hope. He has a plan for those that would receive him after the short-term thing is done. Now, why does it say there that the children of this world and their generation are wiser than the children of light? The reason is because we understand all of these things in a worldly context. We understand the importance of sacrificing now for future gain, right? I'll, let me explain it to you and how I know I understand it in the physical realm. I let them take 6% out of my paycheck every two weeks. Do you guys know that? Uh, and I think most of the people at work do. We have at work the 401k plan, right? Um, NISC will match a contribution, which means that if I let them take money out of my paycheck now and put it in a retirement and an investment account, they will match that money. And that money can grow as it's invested and that money can um, you know, be there when I retire. Now, I don't have to contribute to that. I don't have to put in that. In fact, I would have more money in my paycheck every two weeks if I didn't do that. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is when the day comes that it's time to retire, I'm going to look back and think, maybe I should have planned for this better. Nobody wants to get to their 60s uh, and want to retire and not be able to because, you know what, for the last 30 years, I didn't have a single eye on the future. And I was never willing to sacrifice in the short term with a long-term goal. And see, all of that that I just mentioned, all of that just has to do with money. That's all that has to do with is money. And yet in the physical realm, I can see the importance of making that short term, the now sacrifice, because I can see how it'll benefit in the long term, right? Um, Dave Ramsey, the, the plan that he has, right, where, uh, you know, he tells people about eating rice and beans. And well, I think his quote is something along the lines of live like nobody else now so that you can live like nobody else then, right? You, you, you stay out of debt, you save. Um, so that the day comes that you can give and live generously. All that just has to do with money, though. But he says the children of this age are wiser than the children of light. You know, if I'm able to see the benefit of that in physical things, if I can just stand here and I can clearly see, you know, that makes good financial sense to do that. That's something in the grand scheme of eternity that doesn't mean anything. We're just talking about money, right? But what about the investment that could be made in the Lord's work? Because you and I both know that investment in the Lord's work, that is something that's, that doesn't have, that's not short term. That is something that's long term. That's something that goes beyond the bounds of this world. That's something that will mean something in the next life. You know, the investment of whatever it would be, money, time, energy, effort, ability, the investment that we could make in the Lord's work now could pay what? Could pay what dividends um, in eternity? Make friends. Who's he saying? Make friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Take that which I already explained and considered is in the grand scheme of things small, but used wisely um, could pay great dividends later. I don't think that we should understate or undercut how important it is for us to invest what we can in God's work. You know, as we, uh, as we plan to go out um, and we hang bags, you know, across the road here and we want to get into the next subdivision, 
That is, that is a worthy investment of time. The bags, the, the gospel booklets, the, the pens, whatever else in the future, if we put anything else in there, it's a worthy investment of the money. Um, all of those things, because the potential impact, the potential difference that those things can make in the grand scheme of eternity is worth so much more than the couple hours we'll spend on that Saturday morning or the money that we'll spend. I mean, you know, we have churches that are contributing to it, to us. We have, um, you know, our tithes and offerings that we can, can contribute. What are we going to do with that money anyway, right? Um, it's worth it to spend that money back in the Lord's work and, and to be involved. And I was thinking about that. You know, Brother John has just mentioned here a couple of times over the last couple of weeks, and it got me to thinking. I was reading in my, my reading this week and came to this passage, um, and I think he mentioned it again this morning. Um, that we have some churches that support us that honestly they could probably find pretty good uses for that money they're not much bigger than we are you know th there's things that they could do but you know what they want to do they want to invest in what they believe to be a, a valuable worthy ministry and, and I think that we uh, personally, I, I personally, I, I want to start to take that even more seriously. I want to take it seriously that if people um, in, in churches and even our church that has sent us, you know, from, from Wright City, um, they've given us authority. They've invested in us to go and to do a good job and to do a good work. And it's absolutely worth it. And it's important that we, um, that we follow through. It's important that we try to do all that we can. This, this parable is not about a good man, okay? It's not about a good guy. Um, it's actually about an unjust steward. And yet the Lord commended him because uh, I see what you did. I see how you had an eye on the future, and you were willing to expend in the here and in the now so that your future, you know, so that future things could be taken care of. Um, and the children of this generation are wiser, it says at times, than the children of light. Now, if I can stand here and talk about Dave Ramsey and my 401k, and I can obviously show, no way, it, it's easy to see that a potential sacrifice or investment now is worth it for the long-term gain. Uh, why do I struggle to see that in the spiritual realm? Why do I struggle to see that the time that I would invest in God's word or in God's work or, or in our mission work, our church, um, that that is absolutely worth it. Why is it that, you know, I can go and I can do and I can spend, whether it be time, money, effort, energy, in, in something else, and I'll do it because I enjoy those things, right? I enjoy those things. It, it's, it's never a matter of cost. It's never a matter of money or time because it's something that's, that I enjoy and that it's worthwhile. Um, why can't I look at that with that same attitude toward the Lord's work? Why can't this be something that, yes, we sacrifice for? Yes, we give of ourself for, um, but enjoy it and know that in the long term, uh, man, this pays great dividends. The, the investment that we could give into God's work, um, it'll absolutely be worth it, okay? I want to con, you know, just kind of confirm here as we close, the context of Luke chapter 16 is obviously money, okay? Um, and in a sense, that is, that's part of it. Uh, I would take it a step further, and I would say that any investment that we make, that's why I throw in things like our, our time, our effort, the, the work that we can, giving of ourselves just to the Lord and His work, um, if I can see clearly how beneficial it is in physical things, Lord, help me to see that it's beneficial in spiritual things and that there's no amount of time or investment that I can give to the Lord's work that won't ultimately be worth it. Have an eye on the future. Now let's close with just a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1, it says, um, 
Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Okay? If, if you could have one character trait for someone that you left in charge of your affairs, would it be, this is the smartest person I know? Probably not. Would it be, this is the best looking guy that I know? No, probably not. Um, this is the most popular guy that I know. No. If you left somebody in charge of your affairs, you would want to know of their faithfulness and their dedication. Right? That would be the first character trait that you would expect if you were to put someone in charge of your stuff. Well, the Lord left this world. He told us to occupy until he comes. He has left us in charge of his affairs in this world. Um, it's expected of us that we be faithful. And lastly, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse number 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And charge them, verse 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, you know, if you're not rich in money, you can be rich in good works. Uh, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. You see how in verse number 18, he talks about the, the doing and the giving and all of the things that you can do in the here and now. So that verse 19, you're laying up a foundation against the time to come. We often use those um, passages from, from Matthew chapter 6 that talk to us about, you know, laying, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon this earth where Ross, uh, rust and moth and all of those things come. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We don't often say, you know, we don't often answer the question, well, how do you do that? You know, we always preach, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do you do that? Well, invest. Spend the money, the time, the effort. Take it and spend it in the Lord's work um, and store it for yourselves treasure in heaven as opposed to the here and now. All right, that, that was helpful to me and, and thoughtful to me. Uh, as Brother John has mentioned and brought us back to, to the churches that contribute to us. Um, and then as I was reading through this passage, this isn't, you know, we're, we finished our series on Ecclesiastes. This isn't part of a new series or anything, just some things before we start our next lessons. But um, let's give all that we can to the Lord's work. Um, we won't regret that. We won't regret it at all. Okay. Father, we're grateful to come today. We appreciate all that you've done.